Hello and welcome to the Blockade Runner podcast number 81. My name is John and joining me this morning is Ryan. What's up, Ryan? Hello. Hi. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a couple of weeks since we've recorded an episode of the show, which we were we were being remarkably consistent there for a stretch. We had uh, yeah. weekly episodes for quite a while and we've fallen off, but uh, we're, we're back now today. With episode Pre- pretty on me for that one. I'll, I'll own that. <laughs> uh, last weekend was kind of my fault. Okay, yeah, we did have plans to record last weekend, and then that fell through. And you know yeah. that 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 was uh, that was because your life, you know, got a little uh, busy, and uh, so that was okay. But um, even the week before, we didn't make plans to record that week. So oh, um, you know, it's it, I think it, it would have happened. But we, we we've been trying to put out episodes more more frequently, and uh, mm-hmm. and I've been enjoying that. So we'll probably probably do that. But um, um, but it's been a couple of weeks and here we are. So we're back. Yeah. And yeah. in those couple of weeks, there's been a bunch of a uh, bunch of news and like um, just stuff happening. So this episode is going to be kind of just catching up with what's been going on in Star Wars. A um, couple of news stories. And uh, we want to talk about the Women of the Galaxy book that came out a few weeks ago and our uh, our uh, Darth Vader Tales of, from Darth Vader's Castle wrapped up. So we got to talk about the final issue of that. Mm-hmm. In fact, Ryan. Mm-hmm. And uh, for those uh, watching, um, mm-hmm. yesterday my brother Jason uh, gave me this um, "Tales from Vader's Castle" uh, poster that um, was being given away at his uh, at his comic shop. Whoa! So, yeah, pretty excited That's about sweet. that. That's sweet. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's a nice like cardstock type thing. So, nice. Yeah, I'm gonna frame this and uh, put this up in the office because uh, I think um, you know "Tales from Vader's Castle" it it earned a a spot in my in my Star Wars fandom and my Star Wars experience here in the last month that uh, I really, I really like it. And I like it so much that uh, I'll be happy to have it represented here uh, on the walls in my, in my little Star Wars office. So yeah, that mm-hmm. was very nice of uh, my brother to give me that. I'm excited about that. So, uh, but we'll come back and talk about that last, uh, those last issues or that last issue of Tales from Vader's Castle towards the end of the episode. Um, but uh, we're going to start out talking about the news that broke yesterday about Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Um, I guess there was, I didn't know this was happening. I don't know why I would. I guess I wouldn't know. But uh, there, was, there was an event yesterday, D23's Destination D celebrating Mickey Mouse at the Walt Disney World Resort. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so uh, I mean, we're obviously expecting a lot of Star Wars news. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i mean I've, but it's just weird because like it's it has the d23 i guess it's not in the title but it's um on the starwars.com story which of course we'll link to um it's referred to as d23's you know event so like a sub event of d23 i guess yeah. um but i like when d23 is happening you know i am kind of paying attention like oh what's gonna what's gonna sure you know, be going on there but this, um, this wasn't even D23 proper. <laughs> yeah, it's like a park specific version of D23, I guess. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, but I think, you know, the biggest thing happening in Disney parks right now, um, at least for us, is Galaxy's Edge. But I would think for everybody, right? I mean, this is a brand new park opening up at Disney World and yeah. Disneyland. It's a pretty big deal. Um, so, the, uh, the, probably biggest news and the most exciting thing that broke from that is that John Williams is composing uh, Star Wars themes for Galaxy's Edge. Um, and it does use the the plural form there of theme. So we're going to get multiple uh, original themes from John Williams. So um, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. I, I don't think, was this known previously? Did anyone expect this? I No, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. Have, I mean, it makes a lot of sense because I guess, you know, you're walking through the park and you're going to be hearing music um, playing, you know, all over the place. Um, but there's so much great Star Wars music already from John Williams. It's kind of like, yeah, I just figured, I guess I hadn't even thought about it, but I assumed that like they just use um, old music, like right. previously existing music. Like yeah. I wasn't expecting there to be new themes. Yeah, no, uh, I was, I wasn't either. But I mean, I guess the uh, one of the key kind of ideas of Galaxy's Edge is to make it super immersive. And so maybe the thought is, you know, if I'm if I'm walking through the park and I hear Duel of Fates, it's gonna like make me feel like I'm. It's gonna remind me that it's a movie and not something that you know it's from a movie I've seen. I mean, I don't know that there's gonna be enough music that they would have only original music playing in the park. Um, I don't know. It just depends. Eh, I, I guess I don't know how probably much a mixture. 
probably a mix. I mean, you know, um, I'm sure when you go on the Millennium Falcon ride, or if you're in a first order themed location or something, there would be music from, from, um, the films, I would think, you know, in, in those, um, locations, but yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, there's going to be a cantina, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, for sure. And I would think they would play, you know, just music from the movies, but then I don't know, maybe they'll, maybe they'll create uh, original sort of cantina music so that it's its own thing and not just, I don't think they want it to feel like, um, too much when you're at galaxy's edge like oh remember this from the movie or this is that part Mm -hmm. from that you've already seen Uh, obviously with some of the rides like the millennium falcon and stuff that's the case but um with them creating this whole new planet of batu and um you know sort of creating this this whole original story for galaxy's edge i think they want it to be its own thing and not just a nostalgia is not the right word but you know not just like a a constant stream of references to things from movies, but more like mm-hmm. you're in the Star that's Wars true, universe. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, it's cool. Um, did you, I'm sure you watched the video, right? Um, the clip of the song. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, you know, it sounds good. It sounds, it, it, they refer to it as a theme, obviously, but to me, it sounds um, at least the clip that they played. It, it sounds like not, um, how do I put it? Uh, like music from a, a, from a scene, that's more background music rather than something that's supposed to be super, you know, like the force theme or something, or, you know, Luke Skywalker's theme or whatever, not, not something Mm -hmm. that's super memorable in that sense, but more like music that would be kind of playing as a scene goes on. And I think that makes sense for, yeah, it it felt very much like star Wars, like background music. Yeah. Like it it wasn't like a light motif or like anything like for a character. There you go. Now you're bringing in the uh, specific language that we need here. Yes, yes, a light yeah. motif. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. So very cool. Um, but mm-hmm. then the other great thing about the video is uh, that you see all this footage of the park itself um, mm-hmm. as as the video plays, um, which is really cool. So uh, it's showing some some serious progress there, and uh, it, it looks great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that was released alongside of this clip of the themes is two little, I guess you'd call them like teasers for um, attractions at Galaxy's Edge. Um, the first one being the Millennium Falcon um, Smuggler's Run, I guess it's called Millennium Falcon mm-hmm. Smuggler's Run. Um, and uh, we've we've known about that ride um, and we kind of know what that ride is. The idea that, you know, it's going to be you and a group of other people and everybody's kind of got their own little part of the Falcon, you know, that they're responsible for, um, and that sort of thing. But, uh, it's, it's really cool to see the video, um, and, and see the ride itself, uh, because it looks like the Millennium Falcon from Mm -hmm. the movie. And honestly, Mm -hmm. you could tell me that's footage from a star Wars movie if I didn't know better. And it would be believable because it's that like authentic looking. Um, so that gets me super pumped to see that and, and for it to look that good. Um, it doesn't look like a ride to me, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I guess that's, that's the continuing idea of immersion there, you know, that it's going to feel super real, but, um, I know I saw, where did we see it? Cause we talked about this on a previous episode. I feel like I saw a little footage. Oh, the bonus feature on the solo Blu-ray. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. The it's exclusive to the target version. They yep. have like a feature about the one in Falcon. <clears throat> um, did you watch that, Ryan? I did. I did. You did watch that. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, I was just like, oh my God, it looks so real. You know, it just looks like the Falcon from the movie. Uh huh. Um, and so, yeah, definitely continuing to feel that way with this footage. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up too, um, I think they're using very similar technology to what they use when they shoot the films the cockpit scenes and they have like they should, that was part of the, that little bonus feature too on the solo Blu-ray, the way that like when the actors would get into the cockpit, they already had the pre-recorded like hyperspace. Yeah. You could watch the videos. (laughs) Yeah. Or whatever on there. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. And just when they were there, like when they were going to, you know, um, what's the verb I'm looking for? I can't believe I'm man. I'm not good with words today, which is a bad thing for a podcast, but, um, mm-hmm. and an English blast, teacher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I've accepted that. But when they blast into hyperspace, you know, when they burst into hyperspace, when they do those things, <laughs> yeah. When they just like go, <laughs> when they go into hyperspace. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
the uh the, they would see that they would feel that you know and and that's mm -hmm. like super cool and i think it, it seems like it's going to be that same sort of thing so you know hearing donald yeah. glover be like on that bonus feature oh yeah i felt like i mean you just it seemed like we were going into hyperspace like we're going to get to have that same feeling and that same experience and Galaxy's Edge. but yeah and like the technology is it's like a wraparound screen mm -hmm. correct like that you can like play anything on that creates that sense of immersion but like it's the fact that they play the um like the stars flashing by yes it makes it like feel that way yeah exactly yeah so. and i mean I, to clarify i guess i don't know that it's the same technology it might be a completely different like projection system or whatever but it looks mm -hmm. like th that sort of thing so i think they explained it as that because i think there was another interview where someone talked about like watching other videos and stuff on it yeah, it being really cool in the in at the set for the film. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, actually, I think what they have is two. There was a Star Wars show feature about this. I think they have two projectors, that, and they project onto those screens, and they're you know like super high def, like mm -hmm. giant projectors, and they're able to. They need the screen is so big that they need two of them. Um, but yeah, they they project onto those screens and and can put yeah so they could yeah they could play whatever on there, um, but. I got what I'm saying is like for the ride itself at Disneyland or Disney World or both. Uh, I don't know that it's the same technology, but at least oh, okay. it, it seems to be at least of that quality or whatever. You know, it would yeah. have the same quality or for for us as the as the uh, theme park attendee. You would mm -hmm. feel that same kind of sense of immersion and that same authenticity there. So for um, sure. Yeah, I can't wait. Uh, I don't know how long I'm going to have to wait because I don't know when I'm going to actually get to Galaxy's Edge. But So <laughs> this is kind of the thing that um, is, I don't know, somewhat like <laughs> hype deflating for me is uh -huh. thinking about the fact that at Galaxy's Edge, they have one Millennium Falcon. Yeah. And like, I don't know how, I, I don't know. Like, it feels like you almost will need to they should set up a system where like you sign up for a time when you buy your tickets and then like that's the time you go because what i picture is like getting there like right when the park opens and then people being lined up already and you waiting six hours for like one minute in the millennium falcon so yeah uh well, yeah, and I think the ride's going to be probably a fair amount longer than that, too, you know, with the... Because, like, you go on um, Star Tours. Have you been on the new Star Tours? Um, I did in Tokyo Disney. Okay. Um, so, Star Tours is, like, a couple minutes long, probably, but it's not, yeah. really, it's not really interactive, though. You know, you're just, like, going along for the ride. And there's, like, 20 other people in there with you. Yeah, and this this one, well, that's true, yes. But this one you have to, like, control and be... So I feel like it can't be, like, 90 seconds long when you have to, like, make decisions and do all this stuff. You know, I yeah. feel like it'll be a couple minutes at least. But, um, and I might have the exact details wrong, but I think they can have 64 people. It's something along those lines um, on the ride at once because there's maybe... Are there eight people in the cockpit? six people in the cockpit something like that everybody's got a different job and then it's it's i don't know exactly how it's going to work um in terms of the design but there's one big millennium falcon there in the park but within uh -huh. the falcon there are multiple cockpits so when you walk onto the falcon the sort of sitting area or whatever with the dejaric table and all that stuff is going to look like super authentic and exactly how it should um it's going to feel like you walked onto the falcon but then you're going to go off and depending on which party you're in or which group you're in, you're going to go down a different hallway or something. And then they have like a bunch of these cockpits. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So it's not that like, they, cause that would be crazy if they, yeah. Okay. That's what people. I was picturing. So it's not like really authentic on the inside. No, no, it's not an exact, okay. no, but I think that, I think it will feel like it is though. Um, okay. I think they're going to design it in a way that, you know, um, it seems, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there'll be a little break in immersion when it's like go left or go right or whatever. But yeah. um, I, I think when you walk on there, you'll feel like you're walking around in the Falcon and stuff. And then they'll just be like, okay, you go into the, maybe, maybe there's like a door that you go in and then, or actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry. 
Okay. I think I'm, I'm remembering, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, I think what it is, is it actually spins. Something spins um, where the cockpits are. So like a group goes in and they get into the cockpit and then like it turns so that the next group, when they, they just walk into the same entrance, but like the cockpit has, you know what I'm saying? It's like a, Oh, like, a but, like you wouldn't door. know that, like you wouldn't see, like, you're not going to see yeah. it turning even from outside, you know, you're not going to see it turning or anything. So it's going to feel, I don't know how they do it exactly, but it's going to feel, maybe it's up against a wall. Maybe the Falcons like up against a wall or something. So that, like that stuff is, yeah, they you know what just I mean? like go into this other room. Yeah. Well, what, what I'm saying is that the, the Falcons parked there, like from, from outside, like if you're like walking around in galaxy's edge, like uh -huh. the Falcons parked there, they don't want it to be like, Oh, it looks exactly like the real millennium Falcon, but there's this giant like tunnel sticking out of it with like a big turning thing. You know what I mean? Like they're going to hide it. Yeah. I know they're going to hide it. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm very confident in, 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 yeah. uh, that they're, cause they keep talking about the immersion and making it so immersive and everything. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super confident that it's going to be, like exactly what I want it to be in terms of I'll see the Falcon parked there when I'm walking around galaxy's edge and it will look like the Falcon and I will walk onto the Falcon and it will feel like the Falcon, but also they're going to figure out a way to move us through it so that, you know, we don't have the scenario you were describing of waiting for six hours to go. on it. Yeah. Okay. Because, because actually like, if you think about like um, star tours, that is only one group at a time as far as I know um, to go on to star tours. So, right. And it's, Oh, 20, like yeah. 20 people, but 20 or 30. Yeah, probably. Yeah. But if you can get however many groups going at once on this. Thing, yeah. Okay. Even though they're smaller groups. Um, I like that. And I'm sure the demand will be higher for this than it is for, for star tours also. But yeah. the idea of the idea of lines and just like the logistics of going to galaxy's edge and then like all the people that are going to want to go there and everything, mm -hmm. it is pretty uh, intimidating to think about. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if like that's, if it's going to happen for me in like the first six months. Yeah, no, not for, well, see, we, I'll make this quick, but we had planned a trip for a summer of 2019 to Florida. We were going to drive there mm. and go to the parks. And uh, actually my wife had, had kind of set it all up and it was her, her kind of doing, but she really wanted to go. Um, and and, it, you know, obviously we were doing that because of Galaxy's Edge opening. And I kept telling her, like, uh, I'm nervous because they haven't said when it's going to open. So I really don't think we should, like, book this whole thing and plan this whole trip because it might not be open until fall or winter. Mm -hmm. And that is the case for the Florida park. So we have uh, canceled that trip and we're just going to do it the following summer, summer 2020. So um, okay, the plan is that we are going to go there, you know in a year and a half basically so probably six to eight months after it opens i guess yeah that's kind of what i'm thinking because i just think it's going to be such a mess like not a mess but it's i i don't love standing in lines like yeah. that's basically my issue yeah <laughs> like i'm not a huge fan of that i'm just like it drives me nuts mm -hmm. um so like when we're talking two to three to four hour lines like I just, I can't. Yeah, no, I think it'll be pretty crazy. So, um, yeah. so it'll be kind of nice to, to let them, you know, maybe iron out some, some kinks and, and mm -hmm. kind of, you know, but I, I, I really, I think for the first couple of years, it's probably going to be insane. Um, but I, I gotta go before then, you know what I mean? Like, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll see, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very, very excited. I'm sure you can tell from, from hearing me talk about this. I'm very excited yeah. about that. Uh, real quick. They also talked about the rise of the resistance, um, mm -hmm. ride too, which I think we kind of knew about that. We did know about yeah. that. Um, but I can't really tell what it is from that trailer. Can you? Yeah. Cause it just looks like movie footage. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, yeah, totally. <laughs> um, but the, the concept of this is that it puts guests in the middle of an epic battle between the resistance and the first order. So, um, maybe that sounds more like star tours, you know, kind of you're along for the ride sort of thing you know, as something plays out, but, mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. And then I wonder about star tours as well. Um, I would assume that they will keep star tours and move it into galaxy's edge. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. Cause I think at, at Disneyland it's in Tomorrowland, and then in Orlando it's, um, it's in Hollywood, Hollywood studios. Um, I guess I, I don't know. Um, 
I, I should have gone to this D23 destination D thing because I'm, I'm actually mm -hmm. not even sure what's going to happen with, um, with <laughs> Hollywood Studios and uh, Tomorrowland and all that stuff. And But I, I hope they keep Star Tours because it's really fun. And uh, I think it's got a lot of life left in it myself. So we'll see. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that kind of covers it for Galaxy's Edge. Um, mm -hmm. Unless we're missing anything there, Ryan. No. Okay. Well, the other giant news from uh, the last two weeks is the fact that um, Bob Iger announced this Cassian Andor live action series. Um, <laughs> it came out of nowhere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, although earlier in the day, I, I did see that they were doing their financial earnings call or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And um, we usually do get a, um, a Bob Iger um, reveal an announcement. He'll just sort of drop that uh, on those on those earnings calls. So um so that works for me, you know. We can look forward to those, and and he came through this time with uh, with the Cassie and Andor live action series announcement. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a pretty big deal. Um, I'm a huge Cassie and Andor, Andor fan, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think this will be great. I, you know, I like Rogue One uh, quite a bit, but I think mm -hmm. my favorite part of Rogue One is that I really, really liked all the characters. Um, and I've I've heard the complaint about that movie that. Uh, well, um, you know, it's cool. It's a cool movie, but I didn't feel attached to any of the characters. I've heard a lot Oof. of people say that over the years. That's crazy. And I feel like it's almost the opposite for me. Like, oh, the yeah. Darth Vader scene is cool and stuff. But like, what I really like is that all of those characters are great and I care about them, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, Casting Indoor is one of those for sure. So um, it's going to be a rousing spy thriller set in the formative <laughs> years of the rebellion so uh obviously you know rogue one is is um is uh set right before new hope so this will be before that so yeah definitely early days of the rebellion mm -hmm. um i don't know what a spy thriller uh will look like exactly i mean i guess it, it makes sense because he's on all these covert missions from mon mothma or something uh all over or from it, it will um, look just like uh star wars resistance which is also a spy thriller. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, if that's the case, then it'll be like Cassian, Cassian Andor, like stumbling all over the place, like tripping over his own feet, um, <laughs> going like this all the time, being like, oh no, BB-8, what do we do? Um, which for the record, I love Star Wars Resistance. Yeah, I'm, totally. I'm super, super enjoying it. I've, I've seen more episodes than Ryan has yeah. and um, I, I really like it. And um, I feel like it's just getting better with every episode, actually. So um, I've been uh, low key trying to pressure him to uh, catch up on those episodes because they've been uh, they've been really good. I have like 30. I like I'm I'm on Thanksgiving break now oh. and I have like. 30,000 hours of various <laughs> entertainment I need yeah. to try to consume over yeah. this next week. And it's giving me just like paralysis because <laughs> I don't know what I should start. I have like 10 video games here, like 20 movies, like 500 hours of like Netflix TV shows. Mm -hmm. And I've mostly just been like watching wrestling. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so like... I don't. Yeah, I've been I've doing a fair bit of that stacks myself. Of, stacks of books, all this stuff, and it's there's just too much. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Although uh, I have been um, a sign of things to come, I have been reading Shadows of the Empire and also reading um, The Secrets of Shadows of the Empire. So, oh, nice! And That's I'm planning on playing some Shadows oh, of the Empire nice. on my N64. So, yeah, that does sound like a good plan. Yeah, those are all things I'm going to do over my upcoming Thanksgiving break as well. So, nice. also uh, it's completely unrelated to Star Wars, but it's the 20th anniversary of Ocarina of Time. Yeah, this year, and like I kind of want to replay that, but I know I won't. But still, <laughs> yeah, but you could play a couple hours of it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, that's true. Um. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, no, Rising Sp a Spy Thriller. And, um, you know, one of the things that a lot of people have been talking about it, with this Cassie and Andor show, and um, it's something I didn't think about until like sort of the next day, because I was just like, oh my God, uh, Diego Luna, Cassie and Andor, love it. Like, it's going to be fantastic. And what a great character to set a show around and all that stuff. But then it's like, well, wait a second, are we going to see K2SO in this show? Um, are we going to see Admiral Raddus in this show? <laughs> um, are we going to see, you know, Mon Mothma and... Um, are we going to see the bootleg Pablo Hidalgo from that opening scene in Rogue One? You know, <laughs> the guy that gets the Cassian has to shoot in the back, you know, or whatever. Um, 
or in the gut, I guess. I don't know where he shoots him. It's been a while. But yeah. Don't you, I, I've always thought that guy was like, looks so much like Pablo Hidalgo. <laughs> I've never thought that. Are you serious? No, I'll never be able to unsee it. Um, yeah. Bootleg Pablo Hidalgo. <laughs> oh God. So yeah, like my, what's exciting to me about this show is, um, you know, the, the conversation between, um, Cassian and Jin um, on the ship when he's like, I have done terrible things for so long. And that, so I'm assuming that's what this show is going to be. Like, yeah. uh, like I don't think he's going to be like a super heroic character because he's... But, I mean, like, his heart's in the right place, obviously, but he also, like, his redemption arc is Rogue One. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, he gives that speech about how he's done terrible things and it wouldn't be worth it, you know, like, if he doesn't go and um, go to, uh, what's the planet? Uh, oh, my God, I can't believe um, where the tower is. If he doesn't yeah. go on that final mission, like, it wouldn't be... You know, it would it would be disrespecting all of the or not disrespecting, but it would be like all the awful things he's done in the past weren't for anything. You know, if he doesn't go and I'm in rough sorts today. How do I not remember the name of that planet? Scarif. Yes, Scarif. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we got to kind of see some of those terrible things that he's forced to do. Right. I mean, yeah should be very uh should be very interesting um i mean i that that is a fine line to walk because they need to you know keep him sympathetic and sort of stay true to the character the the spirit of the character in rogue one which is that i think he's a good guy um yeah so i'm forced to make some difficult decisions i think for sure forced um, to be the one who carries out those decisions like yeah. i'm sure like that stuff like i don't think of the rebellion the resistance as like a um like a super evil organization but um you know that's the they're like that's the fact of war yeah. like you don't you don't like win wars and overthrow governments by like doing the right thing all the time and being like totally peaceful yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, like Cassian's a character from that movie Rogue One, which really was obviously about exploring ideas like that. So it would make yeah. sense to continue that in uh, in in his live action series um, for sure. So and, you know, a spy thriller, it's like obviously that's the kind of thing where um, it, it's going to be great because it, it doesn't have to sort of t do these like huge epic Star Wars kind of stories. You know, it can be more character driven and sort of like smaller plots, you know, sort of like you see on like Star Wars Rebels and stuff, you know, have like a little mission or whatever where they end up on a, actually there's one like this in um, in, Re in Rebels or uh, Resistance as well. They kind of seem to always go to like the derelict space station, you know, like the empty space <laughs> station, like uh -huh. oh, it's been attacked by pirates and like, are there any survivors? And like, there was like multiple episodes like that on Rebels, I think. And there was a really good one on Resistance uh, two weeks ago, I think. Um, but you know, something like that, like little stories that they can tell self-contained sorts of things. And um, mm -hmm. it should be great. And Diego Luna, I mean, he's fantastic. So um yeah, I mean, I, I can't wait. I'm really excited. I think I'm probably more excited for this one. I don't know. I guess um, maybe I'm equally excited for this in The Mandalorian, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. stuff that is really exciting about both, I think. Mm -hmm. But this was, mm -hmm. like, great news. Um, you know, I love I love uh, Rogue One, um, and it's cool to get, like, more stories set with, like, these characters and in that, like, time period. Yeah, 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 for sure. So you'll be subscribing to Disney Plus? Right? Well, obviously, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not really much of a choice. Yeah, it's true. Um, this one I don't think will... I, I assume The Mandalorian will launch um, sometime next year. I don't think this one will um, launch until at least 2020 because they're not going to start shooting it until next year. So yeah, um, that's fine. Uh, we're going to have probably... Um, as much Star Wars as we can handle next year in 2019. So I think it'll be fine too. Uh, and, we can, and we can handle a lot. Yeah, that's true. We, yes, we can. Yeah. But you're yeah. behind on resistance, so I don't know. Can you? So that's I, I've probably read more books than you though. That's true. 
Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> that is true. I've also fallen super behind on well, the topics. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's yeah. it's hard. I can't keep up with all my nerdy interests. Yeah. Yeah. I like too many things. It's yep. a problem. That's true. <laughs> um, especially with so much wrestling happening this weekend. But mm -hmm. uh, cool. Well, um, yeah, I mean, this is this is gonna be very exciting. I think we'll find out about the Mandalorian at celebration next year, and we'll probably have to wait um a while for some Cassian news, but uh yeah, I think that's maybe okay. a teaser or something. Yeah, or maybe maybe see some art or something like that in a panel. Some, yeah, maybe they'll do a maybe they'll do they, I bet they would do a panel about, you know, content coming to Disney Plus. So maybe a panel that covers Clone Wars and Mandalorian. Uh, well, I don't know. Clone Wars probably get its own thing. Maybe they'll do a panel that covers the Mandalorian and 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 like a little bit, you know, seventy five percent Mandalorian, twenty five percent Cassian, something like that. Yeah. Cool. Um, but actually, we don't we don't know anything about any of the talent involved other than than uh, Diego Luna. So. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Yeah. Uh, we don't know who's like writing, who's directing, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, and it's. Um, I guess sort of last thing before we move on from this is that uh, it'll be really interesting to see um, going forward how many announcements like this we get and um, how many, you know, versus like a, a schedule for films and sorts of, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I, I just feel like the Boba Fett movie, like the Mandalorian show makes so much more sense than a Boba Fett movie. Um, Mm -hmm. We're never going to get a sequel to Rogue One, and I don't think it makes any sense to make a prequel movie to Rogue One. But right. a, a, a series like this makes a lot of sense. Um, but uh, you know, like an Obi Wan show, I think makes a lot more sense than a uh, than an Obi Wan movie, honestly. Um, so I, I think that would be a more likely announcement in the future than a, than an Obi Wan movie. Myself, um, I guess we'll see. But. Uh, but yeah, with 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 some of the drama and some of the missteps in terms of announcing films and and, and trying to get these like films working in a way that mm -hmm. that they're happy with, um, I could see more and more Star Wars content going in this direction rather than 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 films. So, yep, um, I'm totally okay with it because yeah. um, you know I think there is a very good case to be made that Solo would have worked better possibly as a long form TV series. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Yeah. But then I guess the, the other side of that coin is that um, there's a, there's the opportunity to make like a billion dollars <laughs> on a, on a, uh, on a movie in the, in the theater. And, you know, I'm sure they're going to make a lot of money on this streaming service as well, but they're going to want to keep, you know, making huge money at the movie theaters as well. So I'm sure we'll get a nice balance, but, a good yeah. mix but that's what the saga films are for because yeah but they're ending right and there's only one left i yeah <laughs> and then no more star wars movies <laughs> ever no but yep, that's no, true no 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 more star no more star wars saga movies for at least a decade i'm i'm thinking though so no but no more skywalker saga uh, yeah that's true okay that's true but we need ryan johnson's trilogy of movies to come in and be the next like sort of epic star wars yeah story and the, and i guess i guess that feels um more yeah i guess those will be sort of the saga films i don't know um but like i think i think we'll see trilogies and i guess that's what i'm talking about is saga mm -hmm. um these but like i don't think we'll be getting these like one shot um anthology films anymore uh, no i, I mean that's that stuff is going to move to the streaming service yeah no i pretty much agree i pretty much agree and the and the and the star wars sort of story movies a star wars story movies i think they will kind of make more sense as long form tv shows instead of like single movies um which will be great but that, I don't know. That being said, that that does make me it does bum me out. I think maybe they'll circle back to that in in some time, you know, doing more movies like that down the road. But uh, I think for at least for a few years, you're you're 100 percent correct. And after that, who knows what will happen? Maybe there won't even be movie theaters 10 years from now. I don't know. But um, I, I feel like like the two that we got Rogue One and Solo, you know, I love both of them. So um, I'm excited about the idea of TV shows in the in, in the vein of those movies. But um, kind of bumps me out to think no more movies like that either so um but there's time we'll see what happens uh 
as it all unfolds. And uh, like I said before, we've got so much on our plate coming up next year that there is, uh, there's, uh, there's no, um, no argument that we're not getting enough exciting content coming up here. So, yeah. Um, so it's good. Cool. Well, let's talk about um, Women of the Galaxy, Ryan, um, which is a book that we were both really excited about and came out during our our little self-imposed uh, two or three week break that we took with no new episodes of the show. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, we definitely want to talk about it, though, because the book is really cool. Um, and uh, it's uh, this is uh, this book is written by Amy Radcliffe. And um, there's a foreword by Kathleen Kennedy, which is really cool. And, um, I loved, you know, my first experience with the book was took the dust jacket off. Like I do when I get a new book and I'm going to be reading a bunch, put it up in my closet until I'm done reading the book, opened it up. And, uh, you know, first thing I saw is kind of the dedication page and, uh, it was perfect because it just says, uh, for Carrie Fisher. And, um, I love that so much. Um, rather than like, it's not a big long dedication or some, you know, um, she's not sharing that dedication with a bunch of other, you know, uh, people. It's just like for Carrie Fisher. And, um, I thought it was great. It was perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, uh, like the, the cover is amazing. Um, this striking image of Ray on the cover, which I think is, is just perfect. But yeah. then the, uh, the back cover is, uh, a beautiful, um, image of, uh, Carrie Fisher as well. So, uh, yeah, very yeah. nice presentation. My book shipped from amazon a little bit like worse for wear though uh yeah. not terrible but like just like the spine and i feel like it, it's like a slightly warped um i guess you'd say like the pages are a little bit feels like it got humid or something my oh. book on forge but uh it's not too bad nothing too bad but uh it's not it's not as minty as i would have liked <laughs> is yours uh nice and minty yeah yeah oh, and it's such like a great feeling book like it's such a good size and mm -hmm. like the page quality and the texture and the way the cover feels and even the way the dust dust jacket feels like is just fantastic yeah 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 i think so yeah absolutely um so the format of the book which we knew but uh the format of the book is basically an alphabetical uh, collection of original art um, from uh, female and non-binary um, Star Wars uh, artists, or I guess artists in general who are doing Star Wars art in this case. Um, so it's alphabetical with these uh, these images, these uh, drawings and paintings. Um, but then it also has a write-up from Amy Radcliffe about uh, each character. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of the setup of the book and. It's uh, what, about 230, 250 pages, something along those lines, 230 pages, I think. Yeah. Um, so I don't know about you. My favorite entries are the ones that are film characters. Mm. Um, and uh, it's because um, the ones that are, are film characters or, or even a character like Ahsoka, who's not a film character, but is, you know, obviously um, in the Clone Wars and, and in Rebels and stuff, um, that gets in those ones get more into the creation of the character um and um the way the actor uh brings that character to life and that sort of thing um so i those are my favorite entries um the ones that are not sort of like film characters like right now i'm looking at the entry for aunt z um from mm -hmm. resistance <laughs> Aunt Z's pretty good so shout out to aunt z i do like yeah. this one yeah um but it's really just like a summary of her character, you know, um, yeah. that she's kind of about. Um, but then when you get to the ones like, you know, Leia or um, Ray or, you know, um, any of the film characters, really. Or like I said, like I'm looking at the Hera one, same thing. It gets into Vanessa Marshall and how she kind of brought that character to life. So um, there's just more kind of interesting content for those characters than the ones that are, you know, sort of from like the comics or a novel or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, but I can see that. That being said, it's, uh, you know, I think it's really nice that they're, this is a, a collection of all of those characters. I'm definitely not advocating that they should, you know, only focus on the film characters and cut the other ones out. It's just, uh, as far as the book goes, you know, the ones about those, those film characters are, are the ones that I'm, you know, kind of most interested in, um, mm. in reading. So, um, but, it, but it's, it's really like, it's, it's a, it's kind of a reference book too. You know, it's the kind of thing where, um, if you want to 
look up some info about a character or if you want to remind yourself about some of those smaller characters and who they are you know you can pull this one down and there'll be some great art associated with it and then a you know either a quick write-up or maybe a lengthy write-up depending on which character we're talking about so Mm -hmm. um, that element of it is is really nice too yeah i think um I think the art is kind of the highlight for me, um, especially. See, I was more excited by the um, more than anything, like some of the book characters, mm-hmm. because we're getting like official art of them, some for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, I really like um, in the the Holdo section um, where we there's like an there's art of like young Holdo from the Leia princess of Alderaan book. Um, And seeing her then um, is really awesome. Uh, A few of the other highlights for me are, um, I love this like aura Singh picture, which Uh is basically, it's like that same shot of Ray. Oh yeah. (laughs) I didn't even think about that. That's true. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Really, the highlight for me, though, is um, Sienna Re from Lost Stars. Lost Stars. Like, getting to see her, um, you know, like, official art of her. And it's, like, such a gorgeous picture. And I really want, uh, like, a print of that. Uh-huh. Um, but then there's, like, other stuff. Like, the I love the, the Afra section. Um, as well, but obviously I get to see lots of art of Ephra because mm-hmm. it's a comic book. Um, well, do you have the, uh, I don't have it, but uh, do you have the Lost Stars manga? I do, yep. Yeah, so you've yeah. got, you got some, some that's uh, true, Sienna. that's true. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's really fun. Um, but then like, one thing I noticed as I was like um, perusing the book, uh, most of these women female characters come from the disney era oh yeah of course yeah like, no, absolutely it really is striking how f- and like how few female characters there were in the original trilogy which is basically one well, there was one yeah there was, <laughs> there was one. one um and then <laughs> I guess, uh, well... Well, there was two, if two. you count Mom Mothma. <laughs> Mom Mothma. Mom Mothma and Leia, that's it. Size snoodles. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, and Baru. There was Baru. Okay, you know, Baru yeah. is fantastic. Obviously, we are extremely reaching um, at this point. But, yeah, not a lot of female representation in the original trilogy. It got better with um, the prequels. With There were some female Jedi, and there was obviously Yaddle. Um but no 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 okay time out time out i have to push back on this i really have to push back it got very slightly better with the prequels but like the female jedi and yaddle do not help the case for female representation in the prequels they (laughs) that was that was like half sarcastic okay good because like the like all all of the jedi that are not have a like speaking role yeah, all the Jedi that are on the council, like it's not. I'm not. I'm not even saying like, oh, the female Jedi are bad in the. You know, it's no, like right. all the Jedi. Well, no, but I mean, my my point is that like all of the Jedi that aren't like the primary Jedi are just like background decorations. They are so void of anything resembling like character. And when they do, and I can I can hear the the criticism of that comment like <laughs> already. Um, but like when they do, not that anybody gives us feedback, but I'm just saying like I, I can see what people would would think in 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 response to that but like when they do um have more character like a character like adi galia for instance like it's all through the clone wars or through the comics or the novels or something the films themselves like there's very little and and i think the prequels they kind of sort of have the same template as far as like female characters go as the original trilogy it's like padme's great you know in a in a, a primary character and um you know she doesn't get as much time in revenge of the sith i think for it's just a casualty of the fact that that's that movie is really packed with trying to tell anakin anakin's story and, and uh, obi-wan's story and you know she's featured kind of early on and then disappears from the movie um unfortunately but uh anyway the point is that i think george's 
kind of take on it or his attitude towards it was like, let's write like a really great female character. Like I want to have in a new hope, like Leia's a great character, a strong female, uh, character to, to be there with, uh, with, with Han and Luke. And then I feel like with the prequels, it's the same thing. Like we'll have like Padme, she'll be a great character. So we'll have like a really great, you know, female character, but rather than <laughs> creating a cast of, um, yeah. <laughs> female characters. Um, so you get Zam Wazel uh, early in, in Attack of the Clones, and uh, you know she's a changeling. Yeah, uh, she is a changeling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that that line actually didn't age all that well from Anakin there. <laughs> um, the line preceding that one is what I'm thinking of, but yeah. Although, um, did you know? Um, I was listening uh, as I always do, as we always do. I think Ryan, both of us, was listening to a recent episode of Blast Points, and they were talking about the art of Attack of the Clones, and uh, the fact that um, that Dooku. Um, until late in the development process was um, going to be uh, a character much closer to um, mm -mm -mm. can't believe I'm forget I'm forgetting everything today I'm this is bad I'm sorry uh, the the bald uh, Sith uh, Inquisitor no 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 from the Clone Wars um, she's in the book with uh, oh Asajj Ventress Asajj Ventress yes like they developed like the the art and stuff for that character thinking maybe she was going to be the yes yeah i remember the that. dooku type character in attack of the clones yeah. so. anyway um yeah you're right there's a yeah. lot uh most of the the female characters um or many of them in this book are from the disney era absolutely and they are awesome mm -hmm. <laughs> like it it makes me happy because like every every time i'd turn the page and get to one of like these new female characters is like i was just like oh yeah i want i want more of them like yeah it's good stuff yeah yeah i will my, my favorite entries are um haldo hera ray and leia and three of those four are from the disney era you know so yeah um and i think there's there's definitely something to that um i i really love uh the haldo entry which you which you already brought up mm -hmm. um but that one's great both pieces of art are really good and um the character the write-up from from amy radcliffe is really great for haldo as well um so i love that entry and obviously ray and leia um are you know two of my absolute favorite characters in all of star wars so those were going to be like by default um favorite entries for me um but the hera one is really great too the uh the um description the write-up what do you want to call it for hera is is really great and that's a character i like a lot but uh but um you know I, I didn't expect to uh, to be as into the the um, the passage or the the entry for her as I was. I thought it was great, and it's like one of the lengthier ones too. It's there's a lot yeah. of good content in that one, so yeah, that one's great. Um, big fan of the Mother Talzin entry. Mm -hmm. That one's good. Sure. Also <laughs> the what the, big... <laughs> the handmaidens too. Oh yeah, that was cool. I like that art. I that about. art was great. Um, yeah. Ray Sloan rules. Uh -huh. um, Mama the Hut. Could have could have taken a pass on that one. Yeah. Uh, L three is awesome. Uh huh. Uh, what else? All of like Jessica Pava, um, Tally, um, Ida Versio. Like, just there's so many good new. <laughs> uh characters yeah um i and i like this uh yvonne verlaine one she was uh just i think the only thing she was featured in is like that leia comic uh mm -hmm. like one of the, like the launch um marvel books like that five issue miniseries um, yeah that's i feel like she's somewhere else i think she showed she showed up somewhere else um for sure and i can't remember where it was but yeah that's kind of like that's the primary place that she's from i always read that as evan myself but yeah i don't know i don't know if that's a space name or a normal name but um <laughs> but that's a great character okay but this brings up uh an, an issue for me that like the one kind of main issue i have with the book um, which is that I feel like the the focus is as much or more on the art than it is um, the entries that that Amy Radcliffe uh, writes as as great as they are. But I, you barely like it's almost it's very difficult to know who created this art. I feel like from reading this book. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, you do have to you have to look in the 
the glossary um, kind of bit. Right. It's a it's in the glossary, right? Or is it in the table of contents? No, it's not in the table. The only place is in the in the back. Yeah, I don't know if they call that the glossary or what. But Acknowledgements about the artists is the name of the section. It's called about the artists, and yeah. they're uh, and then it tells the page numbers. Yeah, yeah, but I mean that's that's an I mean that's a pretty bad way to do this because like I'm looking at, for instance, Padme's handmaid, and that's the page that I'm open to now. Mm -hmm. um, if I want to know who created that, okay, well, it's on a hundred page one hundred and fifty five. So you have so to, go I have through, to like all the go through all through all of these. Number. Yeah, and a lot of them have you know seven or eight or nine entries. So I'm scanning through all these different ones, trying to figure it out. Um, and one fifty five doesn't look that different from one forty five or you know one sixty five. It's just really hard to find. And yeah, it would have been nice if just in like small text, like under the text blurb from. Amy Radcliffe, if like they just had like art by in just mm -hmm. really small text, like down there, um, you know, where it says the um, the character's name by the page number. Yeah. Just have, you know, to the left of that, just have art by. Would right, have been right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, if, if you can, if you can find room in the page to write the name of the character in the star Wars alphabet. Um, I feel like you ought to be able to find room to acknowledge who created this art, you know? That's fair. Yeah. Um, so not to, I mean, I, I love the book. I'm not trying to yeah. rag on the book too much or anything, but it's just like not a great thing to have all this amazing original art and then make it really tough for people to know. And, and the great thing is some of these artists are, um, you know, I'm getting to know them from their work in the book. So like there's some of the artists like now I feel like I can flip through and go, oh, well, that's, you know, um, oh, Jen Bartel because Ch Chardier. Yeah. 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 Annie Wu is one that like I notice her art really easily. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So. So. OK, I totally butchered um, Elsa's name. I don't know. She's French. I don't know how to say her last name. Yeah, no, it's probably something Char like Char uh, Charitier or something like that. But yeah, yeah, Oof. but she's probably my favorite. Um, she's fantastic. So and good. You have you have some prints from her, I think, don't you, Ryan, or something like that? Uh, no, oh, I okay. have um, I have some of her like the single issues of the um, Forces of Destiny comic but okay. i've never had the chance to actually like meet her and get stuff signed okay for some reason i thought you had like a framed print of one of those covers or something but um, i just have a i have um some of those covers signed by the writers um, oh, okay i had like one signed by jody hauser and one signed by delilah Stassen. okay but <clears throat> yeah but uh, I, I, yeah, absolutely love her art. She is one of my favorites. Uh, Sarah Kiplin um, is another uh, whose art in this book I, I really liked. Um, Jen Bartel is the artist who did the Ray uh, painting or drawing on the cover, and that uh, I really love. Um, and uh, also, uh, uh, hopefully I don't mess up the, the name here too much, but uh, Sarah Althagy um, is another one whose who's art I, I really, really liked. Um, but to kind of put together who these artists were, I had to, you know, kind of use the about the artist and then flip back to these pages and like go back and forth. And, you know, it was a little tricky, but, um, but uh, those are, those are some of my, some of my favorites from the book. So I think it'd be great if, uh, if, if Disney or, or, um, you know, who published this one, this is one from Chronicle books, Disney or Chronicle or somebody, if they did a print series, you know, um, uh uh-huh that'd be great like i would love to get a couple of uh of prints to to hang up from this book so um and that seems like something that would probably be pretty successful i would think would be popular so yeah um, i mean i'm i'm wondering i'm hoping that um the artists like retain the rights to their art and can make prints um yeah. And to like just even sell like individually at cons and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I also know that that's uh, a, a tricky area um, mm -hmm. with working with Star Wars because I when I when I met Phil Noto, um, like he had he had Marvel prints, but I was like, D are you ever going to do any 
like any prints of your Star Wars art? And he's like, I can't really. Ooh. <laughs> wow. Even the stuff yeah. that like sometimes he'll do something and just like post it. Like for instance, our Twitter Twitter um image, whatever you call it, AVI yeah. or whatever, for two years now has been a Phil Noto drawing of, of Leia. Yeah. I don't think he was like he was not commissioned to do that or anything. He didn't create that for a cover of a comic or a, or anything. So yeah. Like, even those he can't sell? Uh that's a good question. I don't know if he had I I don't know how if he had done any of his like fan art yeah. um, at the time, but I don't know if it's part of like his Marvel contract because there are some people like um, Christy Zulo who did, um, she did a forces of destiny cover. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but she also does star Wars fan art that she sent sells as prints. Yeah. But like when I talked to uh, Phil Noto, he was like, yeah, I'm not a, I can't sell okay. Star Wars art, hmm. basically. Yeah, well, that's I, interesting. and that was also like two, three years ago, so things may have changed. But I'm mm. not really sure what's going on there. But I would love to God if like if if artists from IDW and um, Marvel could sell just have tons of prints. My God, there are so many I would buy. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be really good. Um, and I guess like I don't, I guess like Star Wars doesn't have like an official store anymore, like a StarWars.com or Star Wars Insider like store or shop or whatever you want to call it. Because um, it seems like, you know, back in the day, like with Star Wars Insider when they had that catalog of products you could buy like straight from, you know, Lucasfilm or from the magazine or whatever. This seems like a perfect candidate for that, you know? Like you yeah. could buy a series of prints um, from from this or individual prints or whatever it would be really cool. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, it's a I'd it's a great buy, book. I'd rather buy prints from artists than from Lucasfilm, though. <laughs> well, okay, but I mean, sure, that'd be great too. But I guess m my point is, you know, not everybody, including myself, I don't do this. Like, I don't really go to comic cons and like meet artists and get like prints signed yeah, and stuff. You know, you go to, you go to celebration. Like, it, well, okay, that's true. That is true. But but my point is is that if there was a more kind of mainstream way of selling these, like it's not like those artists are not going to make money on that stuff as well. You know, um, I guess they'll they'll make more if they're selling their own prints. Yeah. But uh, you know, I think it would be a good thing because I think that it would be they would <laughs> it would be they would be uh, they would sell more. Okay, it would be nice to have like an additional avenue. Um, yeah. I just, my fear is just that, like, the artist wouldn't really get paid for that, okay. uh, which right. I feel like is a lot of times the case. And being a comic artist or writer in 2018 is super unsustainable, and you have, like, no insurance and all this stuff, and I want, I want life to be better for these people who create this stuff that's um, great for us. Because... Okay. If uh, if your series just gets unexpectedly canceled, um, <laughs> then that is like a source of income you were relying on that is no longer there, as is the case with um, the Shadow of Vader series. Yeah, that sucks. Completely canceled. By yeah. Marvel. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's wrap up the show here by talking about a couple of comics items, including the fact that Shadow of Vader has now been completely canceled. I kind of saw the writing on the wall um, when they were like, "Oh yeah, he's 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 out," and uh, were what did they say they were going to do? They were going to they fired him from. I don't know what they said, but the, the, the four and five were up in the air, right? Issues four and five of that series were up in the air, like what was going to happen with them. And like I was just like, "Are they going to bring in a different writer or whatever?" Yeah, it would have just been. I mean, they created that mess for themselves, but there was like no way that it was going to be good, you know, if they like, because a lot of people would want to maybe buy the first three issues because those are the Chuck Wendig ones, you know, in support of him or whatever. But then it's like really you're probably more supporting Marvel than you are him. But then like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to like, I would have probably, I would have wanted to read those first three, but I wouldn't want to read the ones that were written by whoever they hired after they fired him, you know, like. It just would have been a bad scene all around. I think it would have been like watching Solo. <laughs> uh, if I thought 
uh, Miller and Lord were fired for like a really ridiculous reason. Yeah, because no, that's like, totally fair. Yeah. 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 Then, then I probably would have had some really conflicted feelings about solo. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but I mean, this, this is just like kind of what I was saying, like this sucks because there were um, obviously they had like, there were sample pages like of this book that existed and there were covers and like all this stuff that like people had, you know, um, put, uh, there were, so obviously there's like colorists and letter letterers and pencilers and like all of these people who now just like, don't like that project fell through. And now like, they're not getting paid for that after putting in like effort. Um, well, I would assume I'm, I mean, Chuck Wendig got paid for writing those comics, I'm sure. Like, I don't think they don't get paid until the comic is released, right? I mean, if I, I, I would assume he got paid I mean, for those comics. Be and, for like the all the issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For work they have not done yet. Yeah, yeah I guess that's true. And probably, like, but. who knows if like people had turned down other projects because they're like, I'm working on this Shadow of Vader thing, mm -hmm. and um, like I, th yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly how the. But then it's also like part of being like in comics is also exposure. And every time you get a book on the shelf, that's like more exposure for you. And like people checking out your stuff because it's Star Wars and then they check out other stuff. And um, I don't know. It like it just when you there's like human effects to pulling a move like this because like one dude at Marvel didn't like a tweet like all of a sudden like six people's <laughs> futures are like in jeopardy yeah and that, that sucks it definitely sucks it yeah that that totally sucks the whole thing is lame um it sucks for the people involved it sucks for audiences because or readers because that would have been probably a great series and and now nobody's going to read it. So yeah, it just it just sucks across the board. Yeah. So uh, what doesn't suck um, and actually rules is Tales from Vader's Castle number five, which um, released on Halloween, and uh, it's been a couple weeks now. But um, it's a pretty cool uh, conclu uh, conclusion to the series there. Um, and if you hadn't heard previous episodes we did on on that series, it was a five issue series from IDW. Um, kind of in the Star Wars Adventures line that uh, features a group of, what, smugglers? Or, no, we, we had this conversation. They're part of the rebellion, right? Um, but a group of uh, group of characters that end up on Mustafar, crash landing on Mustafar, and um, tell some ghost stories uh, <laughs> on their way to um, confronting Darth Vader or being confronted by Darth Vader. Um, and so the first four issues kind of feature some different, uh, different kind of spooky stories. Um, that they tell on their way to uh, their confrontation with Vader. But the final issue is really just all about Vader's castle and, um, and uh, Vinay and Vader are the two kind of main characters, main villains in that, in that issue. So um, not really a, a spooky story type thing and, and actually just more of a, uh, um, you're going to get, you know, uh, it's, it's like a haunted house story actually. Mm -hmm. um, Vader's castle is sort of the haunted house that they're in there. And, uh, and so it, it breaks the format a little bit, but it was, uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, it wasn't my favorite issue. Um, I like the, the kind of spooky stories, um, within the, the framing device of, of traveling through Mustafar. Um, I kind of like that format better than this final issue, but I think it makes a lot of sense to, to have the final issue be the confrontation with Vader and to not kind of split that between another ghost story. Yeah. Um, do you want to know something really sad? What? I haven't picked up my copy of this yet. What? Yeah. Are no. you for real? I am so for real. I haven't because I haven't been to, I haven't gone to the comic shop um, to pick up any of my books. Um, and I probably won't until after the new year because uh, like I, we're going to Japan in a month. So I'm like not really spending money basically. So, okay. but like, and the thing is like, I, I can't just go to the comic shop and buy one book. Like I, when I go, cause there's multiple things I'm reading outside of star Wars. And so it would, you know, 
every week's a twenty dollar trip. So yeah. um, I gotta just wait until. So when you get the, when you get back from Japan, you're gonna make like a three hundred dollar trip to the comic book store, basically. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> like, whoa. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, but like, I just want like every, you know, every twenty bucks counts right now. Saving up for you know. Oh yeah, no, I in Japan. So I haven't yeah. I haven't been to the shop. I haven't bought anything. So okay. Um, All right. Yeah. Well, so I'll, I'll, I'm looking forward to reading this when when I get back. But um, yeah, I haven't read it yet. Okay. All right. Well, man, that's a that is a, I under, I totally understand. No shame or you know anything like that just for, for you, Ryan, for not doing it. But uh, it was just such a cool like every week in October, yeah. final issue comes out on Halloween. Like, it's, yeah. I feel like it's gonna be really weird to go read ep- issue number five in January after. No, but, you know what? it's an excuse to reread the first four, right? Um. Yeah, for sure. And it's uh, it's never not Halloween for me. Oh, okay. I've, I've decided that every um, going forward, every uh, every holiday, I'm just going to watch horror movies. OK, so like Thanksgiving, you're going to watch a horror movie. Yeah. Watch Black Christmas on Christmas. Got mm-hmm. it. Cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. The original um, Black Christmas, not that not the crummy remake. Oh, I didn't even know about that. I don't think. But yeah, right on. Black Christmas is awesome. Yeah, well, uh, you should have subscribed to Shutter, the uh, horror movie Netflix I should service. Have, yeah. yeah, I did that, and um, so maybe I'll watch Black Christmas this holiday season. But uh, anyway, uh, okay, well, I guess I'll leave it at that for for <laughs> Tales from Darth Vader's Castle number five. Uh, yeah, I thought it was cool. It was an interesting conclusion to the series, um, and uh, you know, it was a great series overall. So if you missed it. Um, I would I would recommend going back and, and grabbing it. I think there's a graphic novel um, coming out in. I'm not, I'm not sure when it comes out. It's probably on Amazon though. If you want to pre-order it or add it to the cart so you don't forget about it or something like that. So uh, maybe that's the thing to do now if you if you weren't going in October yeah. every week and picking up these issues. But that was a really fun thing that they did. So um, you know, uh, maybe I don't know if they'll do it again next year. That'd be great. But uh, I would love it. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Well, let's uh, let's wrap up the show there. Then um, we will uh, we'll be back um, hopefully pretty soon with our Power of the Nineties, nineteen ninety six episode or episodes. That's up in the air right now. I think it might be two because um, there's a pretty big uh, event in nineteen ninety six called Shadows of the Empire, and I think it's gonna require its own episode. That's what that's what I'm thinking I right mean, now, Ryan. Jeez, like. I could do an episode so on Sheezer alone. <laughs> yeah. Or just the, just the N64 game alone, you know? Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> First so. three levels of the N64 game alone. Yeah. 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 So we'll see how things go. But uh, yeah. right now I think the plan is, um, at least what I've been thinking is that the next two episodes would be the power of the nineties, 1996 episodes mm-hmm. here. Um, so that's on the horizon. If you haven't checked out any of our power of the nineties episodes, um, yet you can go back and check those out. Um, all of those are, uh, can be found on our site, which is blockaderunnerpodcast.com. And we even have a convenient power of the nineties tab. You can clip on, Ooh. click on. Yeah. It's up there. in the that. Yeah. It's up there in the oh, navigation, no. like click on power of the nineties and all of the, uh, episode, uh, posts and like, there's a couple little videos and stuff we posted of uh, some of the video games and things. Those are all there on, uh, on blockaderunnerpodcast.com. So check that out. Um, and um, you could subscribe on iTunes or YouTube. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Our account for the show is at Blockade Run. And Ryan, your account on Twitter? Uh, at Braun Dwarf, B-R-A-W-N-D-W-A-R-F. And of course, you can uh, you can reach us through email at blockaderunnerpodcast at gmail dot com. And uh, yeah, until then, I'm gonna be digging into Shadows of the Empire in its um, various forms, as it is a multimedia event from 1996 yeah. that that uh, I'm I'm gonna be uh, enjoying here. Um, so we have Thanksgiving coming up. Hopefully, we'll have some time to to dig into uh, various Star Wars things. And uh, hopefully everybody has a great holiday there if you're in the U.S. Um, Canadian Thanksgiving was last month, I guess, right, Ryan? Is the deal. Uh, we'll have to ask Tyler. 
Yeah. Ask our friend Tyler in Canada. There we go. Mm -hmm. Probably the only way to find out. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, um, yes, but we'll be back soon with power of the nineties and uh, more blockade runner podcasts. And until then have a great holiday and, uh, thanks very much for listening. Bye.